Hello everyone, I'm Wim van Haverbeek and I'm teaching at the Hassel University, a Saudi business school and the National University of Singapore. I am for the moment in Singapore and I want to apologize that, uh, for the fact that I can't be with you today. I want to guide you through a number of key findings of the book, Managing Open Innovation in Small and Medium-Sized Companies. The book will be published in June. If you are interested in the book, you can already pre-order it at Amazon. Both paperback and hardcover versions are available. The companies that are practicing open innovation and are used as illustrations in the book are quite diverse. Take for instance Isobionics, which is a small firm commercializing the technology of DSM, a large Dutch chemical firm. The opposite is true for the air fryer of Philips, where the big company is commercializing the technology of the small firm. Kurana and Yaga or small companies developing their own ecosystems in the so-called low-tech industries. And the same is true for Dingens Barometers, who is revolutionizing the high-end barometer market with a new technology, eliminating mercury. DNA Interactive Fashion disrupts existing business models into fashion goods markets. And Prof is the largest consortium in the healthcare industry in Europe. Finally, Open Photonics is an example of an intermediary helping SMEs to use photonics, bringing, uh, to use photonics to bring completely new products and services to the market. So let me start with the overview of the presentation. I emphasize first that we should forget about the traditional open innovation framework, which was designed for large companies. Unlearning what we have learned comes first. Second. Open innovation in small firms always has to be embedded in the small firm's strategic objectives or the business model. Next, we only can understand open innovation if we include the role of the entrepreneur in the small firm. Fourth, open innovation should be considered as a consequence of these strategic changes. As an SME is small by definition, it automatically has to source key assets or key competences from its external partners. So managing the network of innovation partners becomes crucial to understand the success of open innovation in those companies. Finally, we have to understand open innovation management as a dynamic and ongoing process. It never stops and companies have the potential to transform the entire business based on the innovation process. But before we start, there is another question to be answered. Why do we see only few SMEs using open innovation effectively? I try to explain this using a simple figure in the next slide. Let's start at the left side of the figure. Using open innovation can be seen as a two-step model. First, small firms have to be aware of the competitive challenges related to the changes in the industry. If they recognize the competitive threat, then they are aware of the urgency to change their business model, and they will usually recognize innovation as part of the solution. The second step is that they have to realize that they have to open up to innovate effectively. They have to build innovation networks with partners to implement innovation. However, in most cases firms deny the competitive threats because managers are too busy with operational firefighting. And therefore, managers will not innovate, leading to increasingly deteriorating situations. And once they realize they have to innovate, it's too little, too late. We also have to keep in mind that some companies start with open innovation, but they don't know how to manage it. Disappointed with the open innovation approach, they switch, they switch to close innovation. But this approach is usually too expensive, too slow, and too big an effort to transform the company. The result is that finally most companies end up with no innovation at all. Losing the competitive battle, they get acquired or they go bankrupt. Let's return now to the first point. We should unlearn open innovation. What works for large companies is not necessarily the right thing for small companies. So how did we define open innovation originally in 2006? Open innovation is the use of purposive 
inflows and outflows of knowledge to accelerate internal innovation and expand the market for external use of innovation respectively. This definition works perfectly for large companies. There are many projects, some are generated within the company, some are sourced from the outside. There is an outside in open innovation through which large companies can accelerate and improve their internal innovation engine. And there is inside out open innovation through which a large company can monetize on internal technology it's no longer using. It is therefore not surprising that the open innovation funnel was the most popular representation of open innovation. The funnel shows how many internal and external innovation projects feeds the funnel and how different technologies that are no longer used in the company move out of the funnel and can be used by other firms through licensing agreements and spin-offs. We can't copy open innovation management practices from large companies and apply them to small firms. There are several reasons for that. First, small firms do not have a portfolio of innovation projects and therefore the funnel of concept is of no use. Second, small companies are not interested in open innovation. Most firms I use as examples in the book didn't even realize they were active in open innovation. Rather, they are interested in creating business opportunities and becoming more profitable. They were preoccupied with business model innovations and open innovation was just a consequence of the business model innovations. Third, there is no vice president open innovation or there is no innovation team in small firms. In contrast, their success of the success of the open innovation in small firms depends on the entrepreneur or the founder. Uh, open innovation success is tightly related to the role of the entrepreneur is playing. And finally, open innovation between small firms usually take the shape of inter-organizational networks. And those networks are governed in an informal way, with the entrepreneur of the center firm as linking pin. So how can we model open innovation in small companies? The model represented on this slide combines three fields of interest. The red blocks represent the role of the entrepreneur, the blue one the strategic innovation, and the orange ones the open innovation activities. It all starts with the envisioning and the articulation of the business model by the entrepreneur. The entrepreneur's vision has to be turned into a strategy or a business model, and that, as we know, is an iterative process. Once it is clear how a firm want, will to create value for the customer and how it will make a profit, it will automatically have to source different assets and skills from and co-develop different competences with external partners, because small firms usually don't have in-house capabilities to implement the business model change. Developing and managing a network of innovation partners then becomes crucial in determining the success of the open innovation. This in turn creates a new role for the entrepreneur. He or she has to take a role as a network orchestrator and has to excel in, for instance, conflict management. This is new for most managers of small firms and it's also one of the major reasons why open innovation fails in so many SMEs. Strategy is the first dimension in uh, the presentation. Strategic innovation or business model innovation represents the starting point for a firm's venture into open innovation. Studying open innovation in small firms makes only sense within a broader framework of strategic change or business model innovation. What does that mean? Let me move to the next slide. In a business model, a firm is defining how it will create value for the customer and how it will capture part of that value as a profit. In order to do so, it has to use key resources and competences. And as those competences aren't available in-house, a small firm has to look ex for external partners. Managing external partners becomes therefore a key process uh, in order to succeed in open innovation. Open innovation can thus only be defined within the broader framework, broader context of strategic or business model innovation. The question is now how we can analyze business models. 
There is quite some attention nowadays among management scholars for business models innovations, and there are many models that are useful as practical guidelines to create new business models. However, most of these models are made for standalone approaches by one company. Business models for interdependent strategies, that, that are those that we need for the, in the case of open innovation, deserve more attention, and we have to develop novel concepts to understand the strategic interdependence of partners in open innovation. The second dimension focuses on the role of the entrepreneur. These are some of the entrepreneurs that have embraced open innovation to change and grow their business, and who I have interviewed to write a book. Examples are Patrice van den Dalen, Dirk Vens, Hen, uh, Hans Erik Schmidt, Twanne Janssen, Paul Dingens, Huub Feijen, Jan van Ecke, and Jan Kriekels. An entrepreneur has basically two roles in an open innovation setting. The first role is a classical one. An entrepreneur has to, get, has to have a vision to grow and change the business. A, vis a vision can be obvious or, in the other case, hard to articulate. In the case of Kirana, for instance, the vision was relatively straightforward, making more expensive bike accessories with a sleek design. In the case of Quilts of Denmark, the vision was already much more difficult to articulate. For instance, it was about providing a functional quilt for a healthy sleep, and that was a new to the world innovation. Who can, for instance, define what a healthy sleep is? And how to translate these insights into technical specs for a functional quilt? The most revolutionary vision is DNA Fashion Interactive's eye styling. They wanted to introduce virtual shopping for fashion goods back in 2008. It took them years to get the business model right, and they even developed the business model piecewise, commercializing first the body scanner before they could deliver a virtual shopping experience to the customers. Articulating and, develop and developing a business model is a process that unfolds over time. It's essentially a discovery-driven growth process in which every new step in the development of the strategy leads to new growth opportunities for the company. Curana is a great example. The company started as an OEM, changed into an ODM, switched to a proactive design as a new strategy, and finally moved to a strategy based on a newly developed brand name. Each phase sets the stage for the next move. The second role of the entrepreneur is a new role. In open innovation, an entrepreneur is responsible for developing and managing the network of partners. And this can be done in a hands-on way, with active support and control of the central firm, or in a hands-off way, where the network is managed by rules or even implicit rules. The fact that the entrepreneur plays a crucial role in open innovation also has a downside. If he or she leaves the, the firm, then the network may implode. The third dimension introduces open innovation. To realize the business model innovation, a small firm needs to combine internal and external knowledge. In the case of Curana, for instance, the central firm has knowledge about the market and steel, but it needed an external design company and a polymer extruder as key partners, bringing in crit critical competences to make the first premium price design mudguard. Networks of innovation partners are powerful instruments. The innovation power is not located in the individual firms, but in the network itself. Companies become innovative by combining their forces. And innovation networks can shape the company's fortune, and, it, and they can even transform the industry, as in the cases of Curana and Yaga. Innovation networks may lead to higher vo value creation and higher profitability. But we should also see networks as dynamic, ent uh, dynamic entities, crucial assets, should eventually be integrated in the central company. 
Think about design in the case of Kirana and research and development in the case of Quilt of Denmark. The need to integrate crucial assets or competences will most likely lead to tensions and changes in the network. Finally, innovation networks are powerful tools to, develop, to deliver a sustainable competitive advantage because it's difficult and time-consuming for competing companies to set up a similar network. The downside is that a network also acts as a barrier in adapting or changing the firm's strategy. A company can be locked into its own ecosystem. The fourth dimension focuses on the need to manage the network of external partners. In the next slides I focus on how Kirano's CEO, Dirk Fens, is managing his network of partners. One of the most interesting findings is that the connections are built on personal ties between the main partners. SMEs don't have time to ink big contracts. A lot is based on personal understanding between the key players in the, org in the partnering organizations. Therefore, trust and transparency between the partners is crucial. The partners also have to invest equally in time and money. They should be willing to take risks and they have to agree upon the time and hor of the time horizon sorry, of the project. Any major disagreements on the time and money invested will lead to failures. It is also important to realize that the leading small company has to assimilate the knowledge of the other partners over time. The network will become more effective if this company knows more about its partners. Effectively using the knowledge of your partners is crucial in creating value for your customers. Project management by the center company is also important. Each partner in Open Innovation will be busy with its own part of the project. And they may, they may add some additional costs finishing their part, which in the end leads to excessive costs for the whole project. Keep in mind that tensions always pop up during the collaborations. In order to deal with this tension, it's vital to realize that open innovation implies open communication. And therefore, a company like Kurana is organizing regularly evaluation sessions with its partners. The company is also supporting its partners when they have problems. Their problems will be your problems after a while, says Dirk Fens. Depending on the national culture, Partners may organize open bookkeeping sessions. If a polymer extruder, for instance, is confronted with lower profitability because of rising oil prices, Kurana may decide to increase the price for its plastic components so that the profitability of the polymer extruder is restored. The strength of an innovation framework is thus determined by the strength of its weakest partner. Innovation in the network also requires discipline. Therefore, the leading company, here in this case Kurana, will set the rules for disloyal behavior. Kurana, in the case of Kurana, partners have to stick to the business model of Kurana, who guarantees an exclusive design for each customer. Selling parallel into the market is not allowed, and if partners do not respect this rule, Kurana will exclude them from the network. And being excluded from the network means that you are excluded from the wellsprings of creativity and innovation. A company can innovate together with its partners in a standalone mode, innovation power dies. So what about IP when you collaborate with innovation partners? It's of course important to make proper arrangements with your partners. Co-creating technology does not necessarily imply that patents have to be co-owned. Usually partners are better off by agreeing that one of them owns the patent, while the other can use it in a specific application domain. In this way, it's clear who, who is going to pay for the cost and who has to take action if competing companies are infringing the technology. Let me finish this section with two general remarks. First, make sure that all partners in the network are better off than in the case that they would not join or stay in the network. Second, Keep in mind that the open innovation includes cost and therefore the benefits of open innovation should be a multiple compared to the situation where companies work on their own. 
Strong economic benefits will function as the glue between the partners. Finally, open innovation can also be used as a tool for business transformation. First, learning how to manage a network is a gradual process. In all the case studies described in the book, open innovation management has been gradually developed over time. The most interesting example is Prof, where Jan van Hecke gradually learned how to manage effectively a large network by continuously experimenting with new ways of working with partners. Second, open innovation can also lead to completely complete new business transformations. Since 2015, Quilts of Denmark is no longer only a quilts manufacturer, but also a technology provider thanks to its open innovation projects. The company is transforming into a, a comp something completely new. But let's be honest, not all open innovation projects lead to a successful transformation. Dingens Barometers, for instance, could count on an excellent open innovation project, but it was not coping effectively with the underlying economic trends, and as a result the company had to scale back in order to survive. Open innovation is thus not a silver bullet, but for all challenges our company faces. We need to understand the role of open innovation in SMEs over a longer time horizon. Open innovation can lead to short-term benefits, but companies like Dingens, Yaga and Kurana, so even the better ones, experience some difficult times despite their success in open innovation projects. Yet none of these companies have abandoned open innovation and they are, all, they are still innovating with their partners as part of their business model. Several books have been written about open innovation. The three books, Open Innovation, Open Business Models and Open Service Innovation, are written by Henry Chesbrough and they are targeting managers in large firms as readers. Open Innovation, Researching a New Paradigm and New Frontiers in Open Innovation are two books that Henry Chesbrough, Joel West and I have been co-editing, co targeting mainly an academic public. Managing Open Innovation in, in SMEs is the first book which provides a guideline for managers of small and medium-sized companies. I'm convinced you will enjoy reading the book. If you're interested, you can find a lot more information on exnovate.org. The cases developed for the book, Managing Open Innovation in Small and Medium-Sized Companies, are available on that website and you can find teaching cases of some of the SMEs at ivcases.com. I also organized two-day seminars for small firm managers interested in how to implement open innovation in their companies. Henry Chesbrough and I organized a PhD course on open innovation at the Saudi Business School in Barcelona, the next time we organized it in January 2018. WIC, or the World Open Innovation Conference, is the most prestigious conference on open innovation. It will be held in San Francisco in December 2017. We furthermore have lively discussions on open innovation in online communities like uh, both on Facebook and LinkedIn. And finally, I want to pay some attention to the MOI project or managing and organizing open innovation. This is a project I lead with Henry Chesbro. We intend to write a guideline for managing open innovation in large companies. We develop an interactive ebook that functions as a practical guideline for managers who are responsible for the organization and management of open innovation activities in big companies. Thank you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Bye bye.